I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 1. I think you can probably find that one. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3 in just a moment. <clears throat> and uh, I want to kind of wrap up this series, Margin Matters. The idea with Margin Matters is that it matters that we set aside time to be with God, to be still and know that He is God, to be in His presence, to get our marching orders for a day or for a week, to, to spend time with God. If the God of this vast universe wants to interact and commune with and speak to us, we owe it to ourselves to make some margin, create some time, create some space in our life and schedule, even in this busy world that we live in, to spend time with God. And when we spend time with God, we learn things about Him like the things we'll look at today, and they change and shape the way we think about life and how we live our life. So we'll get into that. How many of you have done some yard work already this year? There's, you've had a chance to get out there and, and do some yard work. You know, we had a banner year for rain, so the grass took off. Now we got the heat. And uh, I set out yesterday to do some work uh, in the yard that needed to be done, the flower beds that needed to be done. I just noticed that the hedges were kind of getting overgrown. Uh, really, more accurately, my wife noticed that the hedges had kind of gotten overgrown and were taken over the place. And so I don't know if this is really the right time to trim hedges. That didn't, didn't really matter to me. This is when I got time. So I'm out there, and I, so I'm seeing what I need to do. And, and, and there's a few weeds, I thought, you know, in the flower bed that needed to be dealt with. And then some fr- I wanted to put some fresh straw in there. And, and, and that was like one and two on my list of ten things that I hoped to get accomplished yesterday. How many of you put more on the list than you can actually get done sometimes. And, and, and so I did that and thought I was going to get, you know, through 10. I got through two. But uh, later in the afternoon, I realized I was out of time. We had somewhere we had to go. And so I was wrapping up and, and getting ready to come in. And I realized what many of you have realized when you've done work outside is that the sun had drained me. You know what I'm talking about? Like you just feel kind of drained. Now it's not hot yet. I tell my boys, you know, get back out there. It's not hot yet, you know. Get a popsicle. Go play again. You know, it's not hot yet. It's going to get hot. This is not hot, you know. And, but, but, it, but you get out there and you work even in 85-degree weather with a, a 150% humidity, and, you know, it's hot. And so the, the, the sun and the work in the sun kind of drains you. And so then probably all of us have a way we like to rest or unwind or recover some of you, you know, you got to go take pain relievers. Some of you lay down on the floor, turn the fan on high and try to cool down. Some of you drink a lot of water, whatever it is. Maybe, you know, get in a shade tree, under a shade tree in a chair with some sweet tea and look at what you did, you know, to, to just admire it for a little while. You know, maybe that's how you rest. And the Bible talks about God resting at the end of the six days of creating. And so I wanted to start out today with just a little question for us, and, and, and we'll, we'll answer it as we go along. But, but, but did God rest on the seventh day because he was tired? Like, we get tired when we work. Now, he had done a lot, but did he expend any energy in doing it? The power in God's words, God's speaking, is amazing. And you read it in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, And God said, let there be light. This is not like let there be a light bulb that produces enough light for one room. Let there be a sun, in other words. It says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. The remaining verses say, and God said, let there be, and it was so. And God said, let there be, and it was so. And God said, let there be, and it was so. In Psalm 33, in verse 6 and verse 9, it says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host, by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke it, and it came to be. But was he tired? Did he expend any energy in doing it? We don't have to speculate. Isaiah answers this question, Isaiah 40 and verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. And his understanding, no one can fathom. So God rested, but he didn't rest like you and I rest. He didn't rest to recover. He didn't drink sweet tea under a shade tree when he rested. Let me tell you how God rested. He stopped talking. He just stopped 
speaking things into existence. That's how God rests. One day when you get to be God, you can do cool things like that. But until then, only God can rest that way where he just stops talking and takes a break from his creating. There's an important truth contained in that about God that I want to kind of speak about today, and that is this. By the mere exercise of his will, God produces whatever he wills. But by the mere exercise of his will, God produces whatever he wishes to produce. It, it's unlimited power that the Bible describes about our God. Now, you would think that he'd have to at least speak loudly to make this stuff happen or speak with a deep voice. Have you all ever heard those people that you think that, that's, that'd be a good, they, they would be good at doing the voice of God? This is God speaking. You know, we have one. Otis is here on Wednesdays, and he'll, he'll lead us in prayer. And, and when he does, it's like hearing the voice of God. It's the, it's the deep, deep, uh, deepness. I don't think that's the word. His voice is deep, and so it sound, and, you, and you've seen people play the voice of God in movies, and some people just have the, the perfect what you Surely he had to be loud. I feel like I'm loud today. I think it's because I'm excited, okay? i got something to share with you that I'm excited about. But surely he had to speak loud or in that deep God voice to make this stuff happen. Well, not according to Job chapter 26 and verse 7. It says, He spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. Do you know how much clouds weigh? I had to look it up. According to scientists, the weight of the average cumulus cloud is 1.1 million pounds. That means that at any given moment, there are millions of pounds of water floating over your head. The equivalent of 100 elephants. Above you. Job describes it, describes it and says he just wraps up the waters in his clouds and the clouds do not burst under their weight. Verse 9. He covers the face of the full moon. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, depending on the cloud. Spreading his clouds over it. He marks out the horizon on the face of the waters for a boundary between light and darkness. My kids and I, we argue over whether or not it's dark. Every night, you know, I say it's dark, the mosquitoes are coming out, it's time to go in, right? We got mosquitoes that will pick you up and take you somewhere, you know. <laughs> when it gets time to go in, it's time to go in, right? But they will argue and say it's not dark, it is dark, it's not dark, you know. God marks out the horizon and the face of the waters for a boundary between light and darkness. Notice this, by his breath, the skies became fair. It says in verse 14, And these things that Job is describing are but the outer fringe of his works. How faint the whisper. This is just a whisper of God. How faint the whisper we hear of him. If that's how he whispers, then Job poses this question. Who then could understand the thunder of his power? Psalm 8. In verse 3, it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, God, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You know, you and I can set objects on another object, but God takes things like the moon and sets them in their place, on nothing. Do you all know how heavy the moon is? Do you know how much the moon weighs? Well, of course, the answer is none at all, since the weight of an object is the net gravitational force acting on a body, and as with all other orbiting in the solar system, it's just like an astronaut circling the, around the Earth. It is weightless. Now, there's debate about that. You should look that up. You can read the scientists and the physicists debating whether the moon is weightless or not because of the fact that it is floating in space. Our God took the moon and set it in its place on nothing. 
Job says. And Job says, this is just his whisper, the outer fringe of his work. This is just your glimpse of God. Now, I know you didn't come here for a science lesson, so let's, let's talk about how this affects us in this big and powerful God. Let me ask you this question. Let's be honest. I want you to be honest. Okay, don't lie to yourself. All right, be honest with yourself right here. Think about this question. Have you ever come to God in prayer and wondered if he was able to do what you wanted or needed him to do? I can ask it another way, for those of you that are shaking your head no, and ask it this way. Even though we give assent, mental assent, to the fact that God has unlimited power, almost all of us would agree, if we have ever prayed, that we have categorized things as hard things and easy things for God. It's really a ridiculous thought based on things we just talked about. It's kind of like us saying to God, God, brace yourself, I got a biggie. And I can see him in heaven going, oh, really? Let, Let me sit down for this one. Try me. But that's what we do. We say this is a difficult thing. This is an easy thing. This is a hard thing. The Bible says there's nothing impossible with God. And that evidence is all around us. And that's where this gets more personal. So, so write this down. If you're the writing down type, write this down. The issue is never can he, but will he. The issue is never can he, but will he. In other words, the issue is his will, not his power. Because by the mere exercise of his will, God produces whatever he wills. One of the cool things you'll see in the New Testament when Jesus is walking around and healing people and doing miracles, one of the cool things you'll see is that the people who were healed of diseases actually had better theology than the religious people. Go look up the blind man in the book of John and his, his, his being questioned by the religious leaders, and he had better theology than they did. But so did the leper, which I want to point out in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2. When you have leprosy in the first century, this is a bad diagnosis. You have to go outside of the city. You are ostracized. You have to be separated from your family. It's very contagious. Your skin is rotting off. You are going to die. This man got to Jesus. And it says, a man with leprosy came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, if you are able, help me. Is that what it says? Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand, touched the man, and said, I am willing. Be clean. Immediately, it says, he was cleansed of his leprosy. See, we need to have the confidence of this leper where we bypass the whole discussion about is he able and we just come to God and say, God, if you're willing, you can do this. You can fix this. Now, where does that kind of confidence come from about God? What we've been talking about in this series. It comes from you knowing what this says about him. This highlights your own observations and says the reason it's this way is because God did this and God did that and God spoke and without exerting any energy, he created all the things that you see in six days and then he quit speaking. And when you read this, it reminds you of who he is and you get a confidence that builds up in your mind and heart. And so then when it comes time to make a decision, when it comes time to lift a prayer up, you'll think about whether he's willing, not whether he's able. So we have to put his, his word in our mind and heart if we want to think like that, if we want to live like that. But too often I find people, they, they want to flip the script on God. They want to flip the script on God. They are interested in his power, but what they want is they want God's power to be used for their will as opposed to them aligning their life with his will. What, they don't really want a personal, relatable God. They want Santa Claus in the sky. God, here's my will. Please do it. Please bless it. Please make it happen. God, don't play that game. That's not how he works. He's not a genie in a bottle. You get your life in alignment with his will, and then you'll see his power at work in your life. 
So as we build on this reality, I want you to think about the fact that when we do live in the will of God, we will live in this unlimited power. We see it over and over again in Scripture. Let me give you an example. Anybody heard of David and Goliath? Raise your hand. This will help me if I know you're still awake and we're here and David and Goliath. Everybody's, this is a Bible story. It's in the Bible. You can look it up later. I'm not going to turn to it. David and Goliath, okay? You got this big, big guy, bigger than Shaq. You know, he's out there, biggest guy anybody's ever seen, holding this spear bigger than anybody else could. No one else can even hold it up. He's standing out there, and every day he comes out, and he mocks God in front of Israel's army. And he blasphemes God, and he curses God, and he mocks God, and everybody is afraid of this guy. David, who's not even old enough to be in the army, is back home with dad. Dad says, go check on things, see how things are going. David waltzes up in there, and he, he sees this guy out here cursing his God. Now, everybody else is shaking in their boots, and David's like, who is this guy? What are y'all doing? He saw something no one else saw. He said, is anybody going to take this man? What will the king do for whoever shuts this big mouth up? And his brothers mocked him, said, won't you go back home to dad? He said, I will take that dude. I'll take him. He saw something no one else saw. Well, people heard that. They took him into Saul, and Saul's like, I don't know. It's really not a good idea. And he said, I, I'm going to take him out. Nobody's going to talk about my God that way. I'm going to take that guy out. Saul says, okay. Well, he puts the, you know, takes the traditional mindset. He puts the armor on him or whatever that's too big. And David came hardly walk around. He said, I don't need that. I faced things before, and I got a staff, and I got a slingshot, and God will, God will take that guy out. God's going to shut his mouth, and I'm ready to go. Reluctantly, Saul let him go. And you know the rest of the story. And David becomes a hero, and they conquered their army. But listen, God had already said, I give you victory over the Philistines. David knew that. He was already walking in the will of God. He walked up into a situation. He didn't have to pray about the will of God. He already knew what the will of God was. I give you victory over them. He had sense enough to know nobody's going to blaspheme my God that way. I'll take him out. That was David's attitude. Joshua uh, was, a, was a similar type leader. I, I want you to see this in Joshua chapter 10. Turn to Joshua chapter 10. Turn to Joshua chapter 10. I don't know why I'm yelling today. It's just I'm excited, okay? <laughs> Joshua chapter 10, verse 7. These five different kings had brought war against uh, uh, an ally of Israel. And they said, hey guys, come help us. And so Joshua and his army are marching, starting in verse 7. They marched up from Gilgal with the entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I've already given them into your hand. That's a promise. God makes lots of promises. They're contained here. Many he's given to you, and you can claim them as Joshua claimed this one. He said, don't worry about it. I've already given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march. Now, here's the thing you'll notice in this story about God is that God still expects you to do His part. God's going to do His part, but He expects you to do your part. So they marched all night, okay? And they took the other uh, uh, army, the armies, by surprise. The Lord did His part. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. They pursued them. And it says, as they fled before them, the Lord hurled, verse 11, hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. See, most of the armies they faced were more powerful, more experienced, had better weaponry, but God said, I, I don't fear them. I've already taken care of it. But as much as exciting as that is, that's not even the story. Look, verse 12. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still. Now, if he'd been a scientist, he'd have said, Earth, stand still. Because the sun was already still. But he didn't know that, and God, it didn't bother God that he didn't know his science, because, you know, all that hadn't been discovered yet. And so he says, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Agilon. This is a prayer. We'll see that in a minute. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since. 
a day when the Lord listened to a human being, meaning in this regard, to put the planets on pause. Never happened before, never happened since. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. You know, Joshua didn't seem, as I can, best I can tell, to consider whether this was a hard thing or an easy thing. He just went to God with the request that was in line with his will. Joshua was ig- ignorant about the fact that the earth was moving rather than the sun. And we've offered up some ignorant prayers in our day because we didn't know everything that was going on. But God is not, God is not distracted by that. God is not, uh, that, that doesn't offer any, God any problems. He can handle ignorant prayers. Joshua did not ask God even if he was willing because he felt like this was part of his revealed will. I give you victory over these people. What Joshua said was, we can finish this today. We don't have to put this off to tomorrow. God's already declared victory. God, you just make the sun stand still and we'll finish this right now. That's the faith Joshua had in his God. That's the kind of faith we want to have in our life. Now, when we look at the Bible, sometimes we think about all these things God did externally, these miracles, these miracles of nature, and, and we get, we, we're really in awe of those things. But, but the story of the New Testament says there's something more incredible God wants to do with His power. The New Testament story is that this God of sun-stopping power, of Red Sea parting power, wants to come live inside of everybody who believes in Jesus Christ. That's the story of the New Testament. Now, I know it's hard for us to grasp that we can know and walk in and live in the power and the presence and the will of God, but that is what the story of the New Testament. All of that power, star-breathing power, cloud-gathering power in you, in me. You say, I can't wrap my mind around that. That's okay. It doesn't make it any less true. That is the story of the New Testament. The one who, by the mere exercise of his will, produces whatever he wills, wants to live in you and to accomplish his purposes through you. That's the story of the New Testament. Now, the gospel writers and the apostle Paul, they're pulling their hair out trying to figure out how to get this in human language so that we can grasp it. They're literally pulling their hair out saying, I don't know how we can convey this in human language that God's greatest work is in this era with Him living inside of people. And so in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul makes a stab at it in verse 14. He said, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derive its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. So that Christ, Jesus Christ, the person of Christ in the, in the Holy Spirit, that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That Almighty God would dwell inside of believers, that they would be full of God, full of Christ in their life. And there's more. He goes on to say, Ephesians 3, I'm praying that you would have the power together with all of God's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love, to, 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 to grasp it, to walk in it, to live in it, to be full of it. Listen, we'd have a lot less problems in the world if people were filled with the love of Christ. And Paul's saying, I, 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 I'm praying God will allow you to get it, to see it, to know it, to experience it, to feel it. He said, and to know this love, verse 19, that surpasses knowledge. And then this last phrase, you can spend the rest of your life, the rest of your Christian life, trying to grasp. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. He doesn't say that you would get a portion of God, that you would get a speck of God. He said that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. That all that He is would be in you. That you would be filled with Christ, filled with His love. You say, well, that's impossible. Filled with all the fullness of this powerful God. You say, that's impossible. 
The Bible says nothing is impossible with God. All things are possible. He wants to fill you with His love and His patience, which some of us need. His wisdom, which we all need. His goodness, I know it's more than we can comprehend. Paul continued in this vein, and he said, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. I know He's saying, I know this is beyond your imagination. According to His power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Notice He says, now to Him who is able. What is God able to do? Immeasurably more than you can imagine. Which is why it's hard for us to grasp this reality. According, not to your power, not to your understanding, according to His power that is at work, not could be, might be, should be, is at work within us. You could spend, you could spend the rest of your life studying Ephesians chapter 3 and Paul trying to put in human terms what God has revealed to him. And I'm here today, I'm begging you to, 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 to please dare to dream that this is true. It will be the best decision you've ever made to believe that God Himself wants to fill you with all of His fullness and accomplish His purposes in your life while you're on planet Earth. Nothing is impossible with God. Now, as we kind of try to wrap this up, let's consider this. If this one thing from the Bible is true, that God wants to fill people who believe in Jesus with all the fullness of God. If that one thing is true, then how could anybody think they would find their identity in anything other than being filled with the God of this universe? How could anybody try to find their identity, their purpose, their reason for existence in gender, sexuality, or any other created thing if, in fact, the God of this universe wants to come and fill you with all the fullness of, his, of Himself and His power, which is demonstrated all around us, He wants to come live inside of you. How could there be any identity or purpose in anything else? If that is true. We're talking about the God who started everything. The God who's currently holding everything together. He determines the future. That God wants us to align our lives with His purposes and be filled with His character and accomplish His will on planet Earth. Now, I talk to people sometimes, you probably do too, and they're like, you know, if I could just see some of the miracles that Joshua saw, or if I could just see some of the miracles that the apostles saw, or if I could just see miracles like David saw then I'd be on board with you, preacher, and I'd believe that. Listen, the people that saw the miracles of God were already walking in the will of God. You want to see miracles of God? You need to start walking in the will of God. When Jesus said that you can pray about anything in my name and I'll grant it, it's because that person's walking in the will of God, seeing the miracles of God and the power of God all the time. But that's how that happens. No other way. Miracles happen when people align their lives with God's will. Now, if the God of this universe wants to fill you with himself to your fullest capacity, then to miss that is to miss the point of your existence. That's what he created you for, was to fill you up with himself. Then to miss that is to miss your reason for existing. There is no tragedy greater in the human experience than to miss the fact that God created you to fill him, fill you up with himself. There's, no, there's nothing that compares. That is the greatest tragedy. And that's why Paul is pleading with us, pleading with Ephesian believers, pleading with us by default to grasp that God's wanting to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. To grasp that he wants us to be filled with all of his fullness. That it's all about his will for us and his will in our lives. And I think that's why Jesus said this. He said, what good will it be if somebody gains 
the whole world and lose their own soul. To miss the point is a tragedy. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. And I want to kind of walk you through a series of questions as we think about how we might apply this in our life. If you would, just keep your head bowed and your eyes closed and contemplate these questions I want you to think about. If you believe in the God who by the mere exist, uh, exercise of His will produces whatever He wills, and you believe that His will is to fill you with all His fullness, then there is no power, there is no circumstance, there is nothing that can defeat you. You are an eternal victor. You are literally on top of the world. You are not God, but you're filled with God. It's never His power that's at issue. It's the will of God. The question is, will He? We need to pray like that. God, if you are willing, you can do this. As you ponder these things, I I want to ask you, are you ready, maybe some in this room, to submit your life under the authority of this kind of God? Are you ready to recalibrate and realign your life to His will rather than trying to impose your will on Him? Will you take a mustard seed of faith that you have right now and will you ask God right now in this moment to fill you with all of His fullness? God, fill me up. Will you take your troubles to God right this moment and say, Lord, if you're willing, you can fix this but I submit to and accept your answer because your will is perfect. Will you walk with him this week and live like David? Everybody else saw the size of the giant. David, all he could see was his star breathing God. David didn't think about what might go wrong. He thought about the name of God that was being blasphemed by the giant. And he said, this is unacceptable. David didn't care what the consensus on social media was or what the culture said. The giant was an abomination to God. He didn't need to pray about it being the will of God because God's will in the matter was already revealed. David didn't fear the power of a man. David trusted the power of Almighty God. To everyone else, he looked like a small shepherd boy, but to the one who knew his heart, one who knew his heart knew David was the only real giant on the battlefield. David was filled with the fullness of God. Don't let the giants in your life blaspheme your God. You need to face them. Filled with the power and presence of God. Don't let the giants in the media or social media or the culture blaspheme all that God created. You share the truth in love. Don't let giant temptations wreck your walk with God. Take the way of escape that the Bible promises. Walk away with God's power working in and through you. Don't let the giant of divorce slay your family. Let the fullness of God's love fill you and work in you as you love your spouse and you love your family. Don't let giant financial debts depress you. Commit your resources to the Lord today and let Him bless your resources. Don't let the fear of disease or death control you. Be filled with the fullness of God and let Him guide you through this life and safely into the next. Our God, by the mere exercise of His will, He produces whatever He wills. The Bible says His will is to fill you up, to fill you with Himself. My friends, that's who you are. You're loved by God. That's who you are if you accept Him, if you choose Him. That is your identity. It can't be found in anything else. Your identity is found in the Creator of the universe, not in created things.